The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com, where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? I am your host, Soraya, as always, here on Where Did The Road Go? And this week, we have kind of the a second part of an interview, in a sense. Uh, we have John Ward, Dr. John Ward with us, who's going to be talking about the Exodus reality. About a month ago, we had Scott, Scott, Scotty Roberts. I'm stuttering nicely. Um, Scotty Roberts on talking about his version of uh, the research in this book. And this week, we have John Ward. Are you there with us, John? I am indeed. Good morning, Sir Ryan. How are you doing, sir? Uh, a little discombobulated, but overall pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and where you are, it's it's 6 a.m., isn't it? It is indeed. It's just one minute past. Wow. And you are where? I, in Luxor, in the, mm. the heart of ancient Thebes, uh, which is uh, south of modern-day Cairo. And that I'm must... Stone's throw from the Nile. And that must be an amazing place to live. It is. Hmm. It has it has its ups and downs, I suppose. Well, I'm <laughs> but, sure, but the, the the stuff that's there is just, you know, amazing. As you, well, you do know. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, as I said, I was actually speaking with someone the other day, and they they asked me a question like, why why do I live in such a place? And I said, well, I don't see many pyramids rising above the landscape in the in the city of London. <laughs> um, so I, I can only do my job here, really. Hmm. <laughs> And how long have you lived there? I well, actually, I'm, I've been here for ten years, mm. um, full time now, um, but on and off for fifteen years. Uh, it's uh, it's an amazing place to live, um, regardless of of the research and and my other work that I carry out here. Um, but as a place to actually live, it, it is um, fascinating. It, 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 every day is a different day here. <laughs> you can. I never. I, I never have a day where I'm not surprised by what's going on around me. Hmm. Uh, are you at all affected by all the political stuff happening over there? Um, I have to be honest. I have to say yes. Um, of course I am. Um, I would be uh, naive and stupid if I said I wasn't. Um, but from from a political point of view, no. I mean, Egypt's going through a transition. And uh, I call it, I, I, I kind of refer to it as birthing pains um, as it goes through this political transition. And there are going to be casualties on both sides. And uh, it's, it's just one of, those, one of those things, I'm afraid. Um, this country has to go through it uh, to evolve, to go to the next level. It's, it's a huge country and it's so diverse. I mean, a lot of people do not realize this in the West. Uh, they look at Egypt and they, they think of pyramids and they mm -hmm. think of the Sphinx. Um, they don't think of the diversity of the country and how large it is and that the fact that most of the population live on the very banks of the River Nile as it, as it winds its way through the country. Uh, there are huge, vast waves of desert here. Uh, thousands, thousands of miles of desert that is unoccupied. And it, it, so you've got this very close-knit community, which is a diverse population, of course. Um, we've got the Islamic religion. We've got the old Coptic religion. We've got Christianity. We've got Catholicism. Um, and then you've got the diverse range of politics. And then, of course, you've got the standard, uh, as we have in every country across the world, the, the class system. Um, and so it, it is very diverse, and that needs to be uh, kind of regulated in a way, because it hasn't been in, in the past. It's the, the, the bottom half of the population have been kind of forgotten about, and the top half have lived in a world that uh, has no idea that the bottom half even exists. So it, it, it's, it's a transition. And it's coming, you know, as I said, there's going to be casualties, but uh, eventually she will come out and she'll be better for it. Do you ever feel... Uh in danger when you're there? No, no, not at all. Um, I, <laughs> I feel more threatened <laughs> when I'm on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, I don't think there's ever been one instance. In fact, no, there has never been one instance where I felt that my life is threatened in any shape or form. Um, there was an instance actually with Scotty uh, when he was over for the in February of this year when we were doing the research for the book and there was just one instance where a crowd had gathered in Cairo downtown Cairo we were right in Tahir Square and we're in our in our car with our driver and we were going to the the museum and unfortunately this this crowd had uh, uh, gathered and they had closed the museum as a precaution after the initial looting that took place during the first revolution and uh, so we carried on and as I said to Scotty I said you know we just go in the opposite direction. You know, when you see a crowd, a mob, if you want to call it that, um, an angry crowd of people who are demonstrating for whatever reason they're demonstrating for, you don't go and join them. You just go <laughs> in the opposite direction. Um, you know, and so then that's what we did. And I said to Scott, I said, well, we might as well leave. And so I, I rang my right-hand man, Little Mo, and organized our tickets. And within an hour, we were at uh, the airport in Cairo, and we were flying down to Luxor within two hours and uh, that's that's how we operate here hmm. we don't we, you know you see trouble you go in the opposite, opposite direction right that makes sense and but I mean I was I was watching some mob flashes actually that took place over Christmas uh, in the States I mean you, you know it, it's it's very so it doesn't matter where you are now in the world there seems to be problems going on so I think it's a case of we, we just take it uh, take it in tongue in cheek and we look at it and as I say you, you take it as it is. Well, I think I think that's just kind of human nature that there's going to be problems. It's just that with technology now we see more of it. Of course we do. Yes. So I mean, it's instant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's so hard to filter at this point too. Well, that, that's it. I mean, the, the filtering process is uh, one that I think we we we've kind of the younger generation seem to to lack that filter. Um, they seem to be able to post anything they want to post on, onto the internet and it's then perceived as something else across the planet. Um, one, of the, one of the instances with regards to Egypt, I was in Tahir Square while the media was showing pictures of this huge mass rally in Tahir Square where there were flares being shot in the air and gas canisters and everything else. And I'm standing there with Maria and there wasn't a single soul there, not even the pigeon. Um, so it goes to it goes to show the the reality versus the 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 internet the non reality that cyberspace which seems to exist and the 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 non, the non existent filters um, and it does it it, it, it unfortunately it, it casts uh, a, a cloud sometimes I mean especially with Egypt I mean Egypt itself relies upon its tourism. For its main business, especially here in Luxor, most of the people here it's their bread and butter, um, you know, and they haven't had that bread and butter now for two years. And th those are the signs that are showing. That when I said at the very beginning, I would be naive and stupid to say I'm not affected. Um, I am affected because I see that on a daily basis. I see the, for want of the, I don't like using this word, but the poorer people. I, I, I see them. They're now even. Some of them are quite destitute. In, in, in that respect and it, it, it's kind of um, unnerving and uh, worrying in that respect um, but thankfully that uh, the village itself where I live that all the people are kind of very united they all come together and they share what they have so it, it, it's not as bad as, as, it's, as I'm making it to sound like but uh, uh, things are pretty dire here um, you know, the, the people are the, 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 the unemployment is so high here now, it's unbelievable um, but things seem to continue, you know and that, that's, that's the beauty of Egypt I suppose. Uh, what, what changes have you seen from when uh, Zahid Hawass was in charge of the antiquities and the sites? <laughs> I, I've seen uh, well, let's be fair, I mean Zawi Hawass was by and I will go on the record here, and I say this live on radio. Um, he did a damn fine job when he was here, and I I, I dare anybody to say that he didn't. Um, he was a great diplomat for Egypt. Uh, he promoted the antiquity. He looked after the antiquity, and no one can take that away from him. Um, since the revolution since the revolution, and this is, has no relationship 
to Zawi Hawass. Since the first revolution, we have seen certain problems arise within the security of antiquity within the country. Um, but that seems to be being tackled now at a very core level, and uh, we seem to be getting on top of that. Um, there are still instances, of course there are, and as I say, I refer back to again, you know, Egypt is a huge country, um, and you can't be everywhere at every time throughout the day. So there will always be instances of that kind of uh, nefarious behavior. Um, but uh, no, I mean, Zawi Hawass did a fantastic job. It was a shame to see him go, actually. Hmm. That, that, that's not necessarily echoed by a lot of the alternative researchers out there. Well, that's it. You see, this is, this is a two-tone thing. With the alternative researchers, they have this uh, guarded thing that they believe that Zawi Hawass was kind of hiding things from them. Um, that he was hiding information and so forth. Um, but really and truly, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything yet that's been hidden, to be honest with you. Hmm. Can you, can you name anything that uh, <laughs> Zawi Hawass hid from the general public? I, I think more, I think a lot of times people were upset that he wouldn't actually consider other, other alternative theories, that he, he kind of presented it like he knew exactly what was happening and that was that. Ah, oh, but that was his, that's just that's just his persona. Um, he has to take that stance, doesn't he? I mean, he's a public figure, uh, especially within the academic community. Yeah. Uh, he represents the academia in Egypt. So, I mean, he can't be going out to say that, you know, that the pyramids were built by space aliens or something of that nature. <laughs> or even though he considers it, you know, he, he just can't do that kind of thing. Um, maybe he does it in private. Who knows? <laughs> maybe he's having conversations with Mike Hanks and the Graham Report and so forth. Um, <laughs> I, but, um, no, I, you know, he can't come out. None of us can. Let's be, let's be honest. You know, we, none of us within the academic community can really voice those opinions. We can, we can voice them and we can have uh, conversations behind closed doors and so forth. Um, but when it comes to our public profile, we have to be very careful and, and how we manage that. And we cannot just go out and say these things and uh, collude. I think is a good word, um, publicly. We can't do that um, because we have, these, we have an image that we have to protect and we have to uphold. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't believe. It doesn't mean that we have our own set of questions. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that we're completely spiritually dead from the neck upwards or from the, or from the toe upwards, really, in some respects. So some of them I know out there. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have our own... I would like to say we have our own agenda, but that, that's quite a harsh word to use, really. Um, but it's, it's a case of that we do have to protect um, the academic community's stance when it comes to archaeology within Egypt itself. All right. Um, before we get into your book, why don't you give people a little bit of, of your history and the stuff you've done and how you got into investigating this stuff in the first place? Oh, Wow. Yeah, um, I know. That's, that's a big order for you. That, that's a big one. How, how, where, should, where should we start? Um, well, how did you get interested in, this, in, in ancient mysteries and such? Well, oh, well, that goes way back into my childhood. I, I don't think we need to step into that one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, it, it is really. I mean, it, just before we came on air, Sarah, I said to you about synchronicity. Um, I think we, can, we all have this, this synchronicity. We sit back in our chairs some days and we, we, we think about where we've been and the path or the journey in which we've taken and decisions that we have taken, opportunities that have arisen and we've grasped, um, opportunities that we've lost. Um, we can start to see synchronicity playing its hand. The universe, as I like to put it, the universe deals us a hand. And... We, we, look, we can start to pinpoint certain points in our life which are pivotal moments where we've made a decision that has allowed us to take the current path that we're on. I always like to think that if we took the wrong decision, the universe would bring us back around again hmm. and start us at that same point again and present us with that same opportunity and say, look, you made the wrong decision last time, now make the right decision. Um, I like to think that happens in some circumstances. But uh, for myself, it, it's, it's always been a case of, um, I've been intrigued by ancient mysteries. It was the, the great Eric von Daniken who started me off when I was a mm. child. Um, my sister had a copy of his book, The Chariots of the Gods, and I remember reading it, and I was enthralled by it. 
Uh, I really was. It, it, it uh, presented questions to me from, a, from faraway lands that I had no answers for. I didn't even know these places existed in those days, of course, as a child. Um, and then as I grew up, I became more familiar with the ideas and more familiar with the geographical locations of places and so forth and the history and so forth and how mankind has evolved across the continents and how the transference of information and so forth. So it was a case of what do I do? Do I follow that pathway or do I conform? <laughs> and I conformed. I conformed to society and uh, my parents and uh, I went out and got a job and got myself a wife and children, a car and a house and a credit card and a bill to go with it and a mortgage and <laughs> everything else that every, every other person does in the whole planet. Um, I conformed to society and uh, one day while playing golf, um, I realized that uh, it, it didn't sit well with me. Uh, it, was, it wasn't what I was looking for really. It wasn't fulfilling enough. I'd reached the uh, the point of uh, I couldn't go any further in my career at that point, where I was living in, in back in England. Um, I had a wonderful family. I had the house to go with it, and the cars, the holidays. You know, it, it was all there, but uh, something was missing, and uh, I decided to grasp the opportunity and follow my dreams. And so we were. Thankfully, uh, at that point, financially, we were better off. So we were able to do, take that step, take take that, and uh, grasp grasped it with both hands, and moved lock, stock, and barrel out to Egypt mm. uh, to to follow those dreams. And uh, that's where life became rather complicated, <laughs> to say the, to say the least. I can imagine. You know, you tra I traded in my Audi Quattro TDI for my donkey at that time. <laughs> um, and that donkey didn't come with air conditioning or lever upholstery. Um, and it didn't have that, you know, that, that, that new car smell about it. It just didn't. <laughs> it had, it had the new donkey smell. Well, that's it. It doesn't matter how many times I sprayed that donkey with that new car smell. It just didn't <laughs> seem to stick with it. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a one. I, mean, I, I look back on that now, and uh, that was new enough. Uh, as I say, that was near enough oof, 10 years ago. Mm. And uh, I, I have fond memories because, unfortunately, now my, 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 my first wife is no longer with me. Uh, we, it was one of those things, you know, it was a, a repair job for the marriage, but uh, it never seemed to work. And, mm. um, but uh, that's all water under the bridge. And here we are today. I'm still here. Uh, I, I'm engaged now to my wonderful partner, Dr. Maria Nelson. Uh, who we share the research with, and uh, it's it's an amazing journey. Um, how did I? The ancient mystery part, and this goes back to your Zawi Hawass question. You know, um, it's parcel and parcel for me. Um, even though I I'm a little bit more vocal, of course, than Zawi Hawass. Um, <laughs> I kind of, I, I do keep it in the back cupboard, but it, now and again I have to bring it to the forefront um, because there are certain bits and pieces that have uh, raised themselves within our research um, that needs to be questioned and needs to be aired. And one has to look at that and think, well, okay, what relevance does that play? What, what relevance does that play within the certain genre of ancient mysteries and so forth? And when, we, when it boils down to it, you know, archaeology, especially here in Egypt, it's all about the ancient mysteries. Um, it's just, just a different way in which we perceive it or look at it or, or give it a, a certain phrase. Um, I was, we're going to be talking about the occult over the weekend and, you know, someone says to me, oh, the occult, Satanism and so forth. And I say, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. That's, that's your perception. And that's what it's all about. Sir. It's, it's about perception. It's about how we perceive certain information. Again, we're going back to the very beginning of our conversation. Filters. It's, it's, uh, perception is a filter. It depends on how we look at certain bits and pieces, certain information, and um, how we perceive them, how we filter them through our own set of, uh, set of filters, for, for want of a better word there, um, and how we then arrive at conclusions based upon the information at hand. And uh, it, it's it's a, it's a game that we all play. I love playing the game. <laughs> all right. Um, and you're also a Templar, aren't you? 
I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> How can I not bring that up? <laughs> yes, I am. Um, I don't mind admitting that. Um, <laughs> And how, I, I how, how did I, that come about? Oh, that, that came about many, 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 many years ago, which I'm not even, I'm not even going to begin to go into that one. Um, let it be said, though, you know, for me, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, what do you do, John? Do you, you wander around the, the Egyptian countryside wielding a, a broadsword on the back of a horse? <laughs> and I say, no. Um, do, you, do, you part, do you partake in different ceremonies and so forth? No. Um, being here in Egypt, of course, isolates me completely um, from all brethren and so for me I always like to say now that my Templarism is a way of life it's it's my moral codes it's the way in which I interact with my fellow neighbors my fellow man and the way in which I'm charitable the way in which I, I look after people the way in which I I again the, the neighborhood, my local village. Um, there are certain people here now that, of course, without uh, employment and so forth, are suffering quite badly. And so I add a little bit more. I give a little bit more. And uh, we, we don't throw away as much as we used to. We, we think, well, okay, we'll know that, that item of clothing, we can do something with that, or that this old whatever, we can do something with that. And so it, it's, it's taking it to that next level. And, you know, it, it's, it's about sharing. It's it's it's, it's um, yeah. It's a moral way of life for me. Okay, and 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 the order you're affiliated with is actually uh, recognized by the Vatican, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. As far as I'm, it's it's still there in England, still going strong. And uh, but uh, as I say, being here in Egypt, I am completely isolated and have been now for many years. So uh, I I just do my own thing over here, and uh, that's it, really. Okay, and. Uh, your most recent thing you've been doing, uh, or at least it's been released, is uh, your, your co-written book with Scotty Roberts, The Exodus Reality, uh, subtitled Unearthing the Real History of Moses, Identifying the Pharaohs, and Examining the Exodus from Egypt. And mm. you two hold very different views on who potentially the pharaoh of the Exodus could be. We do indeed. <laughs> um, the Exodus Reality, what an amazing book uh, and an amazing, amazing journey with Scotty. Uh, the guy is just amazing and I don't mind saying that on the air. He's my brother and I love him to bits um, as well as being the co-author of the book. Um, I couldn't imagine now it, actually compiling that book with anybody else other than Scotty. Uh, he is one in a million. He really is. Yes, we have both two different conflicting theories but at the end of the day they're still set within the same kind of period of time the time period the 18th dynasty in, in ancient Egypt um, history uh, the book itself as I'm sure you're aware uh, from what Scotty told you last time from the last interview was that you know it, 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 it encompasses the three different angles we have the biblical narrative which we use as a, as, as a stand post. Uh, we, we don't ridicule it, we don't take it apart. We use that itself within the book as a running theme. And then we, we introduce our two theories. Uh, Scotty is introducing his theory on Senemut uh, and the house of Hapshutsut and so forth, um, Tuthmosis and the rest of the guys. And I introduce Amenhotep, the son of Hapu, the great vizier, the, the crown hereditary prince. Um, it's a wonderful, compelling uh, narrative, um, but the story itself is is intriguing because we, we just do not know, do we? We just don't know whether the Exodus took place or not. We don't know if Moses existed or not. Um, it's all based upon faith. Now, I'm not a biblical person, not as much as Scotty. Scotty is very, very well versed with the biblical narrative, um, and he will he'll quote you scripture and verse all the time. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not one of those people, so I won't. Um, for me, though, and this goes back to again your questions right, about how it all began. Um, Moses has always been a pivotal figure with me for many years, and it was part and parcel of the beginning of my journey, I suppose, when I decided to leave England and leave everything behind and come out to Egypt to follow my dreams. And Moses at that time played a most a very important part in all that. Um, he was one of the pivotal characters within my initial research here when I was looking at uh, Medinat Habu, one of the main temple, 
mortuary temples here on the west bank of Thebes, Luxor. And uh, if for me, it was always a case of, well, if, if Exodus happened, if all these plagues happened and so forth, and Moses came along here and threw his staff to the floor and it became a snake, and all, all of that, surely there has to be some kind of historical record somewhere. There has to be. Um, but there isn't. We, as archaeologists, we've never found it. Um, there are snippets, there's bits here and there that can be uh, attributed to the Old Testament, um, but it's not clear-cut. And so, for me, I like to deal in fact, I like to deal with tangibles, I like to be able to touch, smell, see with my own eyes before I can actually begin to articulate a theory. So I was looking at, instead of looking at for actual evidence pertaining to what was written within the Old Testament, I was looking for more of a catalyst. And I started to look through the archaeological record for items, characters, um, historical evidence that may have attributed to an exodus, a migration of that magnitude. And what I found was, was I, was, I was in, found myself in the 18th dynasty and in the house of uh, Amenhotep III, who's the grandfather to Tutankhamun, uh, the father to the heretic pharaoh, Akhenaten, which many of your listeners will all be aware of, these two characters. Um, and at that particular time, there was a lake that had been built for Amenhotep III's wife, uh, Queen Tai. And this lake is still visible today here in, in Luxor. Um, although you do have to go 735 miles up in the air to, to get a good view of it. <laughs> um, but if, if you look on Google Earth, which is always the best thing to look on nowadays, um, you'll find this huge rectangular aperture um, next to the desert's edge, just to the just to the left a little <laughs> of uh, Medina Habu as you're on Google Earth, um, and this lake housed a huge body of water, um, so much water in fact that it, it was reputed to have held within its waters the the entire ancient Egyptian navy at one point. Hmm. Um, but it was fed by a series of canals uh, and lock systems. It had its sister lake on the east bank. Um, of Luxor, so in essence, two lakes, um, and you had the Nile in between, of course. And I came up or looked at the various components of this lake, and there seems to be a, a gaping hole, physical gaping hole in this lake, as it is today. It's massive, huge, massive hole in the embankment which held the body of water. It's just not there, it's missing, it's gone. Um, and it's not a case that it's been uh, over the th over thousands of years it's been uh, cultivated or uh, put back to the land and so forth. No, it, it, it's literally not there. It's missing. And I toyed with the idea, and it is a theory, it's just a theory. Um, there's no way of proving this at this present moment. Um, that, that lake broke, and it was the breaking of the lake and the, the body of water that would have escaped that lake that led as a catalyst to the destruction of Thebes, the ancient Thebes. Um, through that destruction, through the body of water, we of course have the, the, the plagues and from the plagues we then have migration. Um, and so for me that was all the catalyst for the exodus itself and the characters involved. Um, especially around the time of Akhenaten, when he left Thebes. There was no reason for him to leave Thebes from the historical point of view, but he did. He left and went to Amarna. Um, he left his harbour here, Amenhotep III. He, did not, he, did, he wasn't dead when um, Akhenaten left. Um, there was the, the so-called co-regency between the two pharaohs. But the character for me then was Amenhotep, son of Hapu, the great vizier, the architect who had built the lake. Uh, he had built the Colossi of Memnon. Uh, he, he was an amazing man and deified 
actually by the, the Ptolemies and the Romans as, as a god in his own right, a god of healing. Hmm. And he's the, he basically, he was a mortal that became immortal, and he's the only one. Um, he's been kind of uh, lost in the record of time, I'm afraid, but uh, he was a great man, uh, a great magician, uh, a great vizier, a great architect. Um, he, the, the attributes attributed to him are, are endless. I mean, he was, he was quite, quite the man of his time. Uh, he erected some statues of himself in uh, Karnak, and uh, the inscriptions upon the statues relate to dedications and so forth. But it, it, one of them mentions his age, and he, 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 he says that he has, has attained the great age of 80 years, but wishes to see the magical 110. Hmm. Because reaching 110 in, in ancient Egypt was the magical year to reach. Um, so, but a lot of Egyptologists and scholars have said that, you know, the, the, the statues show that he died at the age of 80. Well, that's not what the statue says. The inscription clearly states, thank you for reaching the age of 80. I wish to reach the age of 110. So it's clearly saying he hasn't died. He's just saying thank you. Happy birthday. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he so th that correlated with me on the Moses side of thing. You know, Moses, he came back to Egypt at the age of 80 years of age. He then left and wandered in the desert again with the migration, the exodus itself, um, till the age of 120 and then unfortunately died. Um, so for me, that I tie these characters in. I look at the Septuaginta. I look at the 72 uh, Judaic scholars in, in the Museum, which is the Alexandrian uh, Library of ancient Egypt. And I think to myself, well, while they were there, if they were correlating the history of, of the Judaic people, then surely they would have read one or two of the ancient scrolls that may have laid within the ancient library of Alexandria. I don't think it would have gone amiss that they didn't. Um, and at that time, Amenhotep, son of Hapu, was and had been just deified. He was he was quite a quite a, a popular deity, shall we say? There were many a pilgrim taking the pilgrimage from Alexandria, actually, all the way down to Luxor to visit his uh, sacred uh, temple here. Um, and place offerings to him. And so they would have been aware of him. Now, I just merely suggest, and uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this, of course, and you can read that in the book, that they taken the character, the attributes and the character of Amenhotep, son of Hapu, and they've transferred that into the main biblical character of Moses. Um, and so Moses is based upon the living historical character of Amenhotep, son of Hapu. Um, and that, that's basically the premise of, of my part of the Exodus reality and everything that surrounded him with the lake, the breaking of the lake and the plagues and so forth and the, the various scientific uh, information that we have to our hands today. And uh, basically run it with it from there. All right. Uh, got to take a quick 45-second break. We'll be right back with Dr. John Ward. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. Yes, and if you do have any questions you'd like me to pass along to uh, Dr. John Ward, please go into the chat room, www.wheredidtheroadgo.com, and I will uh, pass them along as we talk. Um, so uh, we're talking about your book, John, co-written with Scotty Roberts, The Exodus Reality, and this is available everywhere, I assume. Everywhere where books are sold. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> One of the things that, that strikes me is that, that you talk about these 72 scholars. And why is it 72? Because that always stands out to me as like a processional number. Mm. Um, can, I, can, I, can I stand on the Fifth Amendment here and say pass? <laughs> <laughs> sure, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, I, it's just a historical record. Um, mm. The 72 Judaic scholars who it, it always... It, you see, this is where religion comes in and faith again plays its hand 
we have to take it on faith that the 72 Judaic scholars existed um, in that number. That's, that's, that's first. Second of all, uh, it states quite categorically that they received divine intervention. They received the word of God and were able to put that onto paper. Um, because each one of them, so it is said, uh, sat within their own cubicles, their own rooms, their own scribal rooms, and wrote out the history of the Judaic people, and f through divine intervention. I, I, this is where I have a problem. My faith doesn't allow me to go that far, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I, I, I look for different variables, and I think, well, if they're sat in the greatest library known to mankind, surely surely they would have looked at one or two manuscripts mm. of history. Um, it, it would be, again, I use the word naive, because it would be naive of us to think that these 72 scholars wouldn't have taken advantage of the vast knowledge contained within the museum, um, given the, the nature of the museum, uh, its history, and the, the sheer amount of information that it contained. For me, it's a case of they were situated within the museum, the ancient library of Alexandria, the, 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 the repository of mankind's history. And if they didn't read at least one manuscript or one papyri that held some piece of information <laughs> that regarded Amenhotep, son of Hapu, then I think, um, yeah, that, that, that's basically where I am with that. I believe they utilize the library to formulate their history, which isn't a bad thing um, because they had to get it from somewhere. Right. Um, you know, and so where better else to go than to a library um, and the greatest library on earth, the Alexandrian library, um, prior to it being burnt down, of course. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Can, can, can you that's imagine it. all the knowledge that was lost there? I mean, how much more we would know about everything if that oh. library hadn't been destroyed. Oh, don't, don't. It, it, I watched, uh, what was the film? Um, Agora, Ag Agora. I was in tears. <laughs> <laughs> I was in tears when they burned it down. I mean, there's so many things now we puzzle over that the answers could have been right there at our fingertips. It could have been. And yeah, maybe not. I mean, who knows exactly what was in there, unfortunately. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, you know, when we're wandering around the desert and, or wandering around any of the sites, um, you'll be surprised by the amount of information that's still here, actually, in Egypt. Um, most of the sites, um, yeah, I mean, as a tourist, you go around, you, you see the ancient sites of Karnak and Luxor and so forth, and they're all wonderful in their own right. But the, the, to, a, to a greater extent, there's so much more out there that needs to be explored and, and still needs to be excavated and is being explored and excavated by, by the archaeological community at large, especially here in Egypt. And, uh, you know, as, as we said in the book, you know, history is not cast in stone, excuse the pun. And, you know, as long as an archaeologist has a trowel in his hand, history f will be forever changing as we unearth more and more information. And so, you know, we have to be open to change our theories, change our ideas, change our conclusions, and change the history books. Um, because as we delve even further into our past, and as technology improves as well, uh, we are unearthing more and more information, more and more information. And this is a subject that we were discussing um, in Leiden couple of weeks back actually when we were giving a lecture there we were talking about this and you know you go back say a hundred years and it took at least 10 years to get the reports and the information out to out to the general public or to the greater community today we're we're having information and this again it relates exactly to the beginning of our conversation we were talking about the internet and filters and so forth and and the instantaneous amount of information that we're trying to receive on a daily basis. Um, you know, we are, we, we will make a discovery today and at the same hour, it's beamed across the planet. You know, it, it take the, the, uh, the head of the supposed pharaoh that was found this week in the Temple of Armand. Uh, that was found and within a couple of hours, 
it had gone viral. Hmm. Um, so it, it's no longer a case of we have to wait for a, a dusty old journal that has to be published and so forth and is all very <laughs> academic and jolly good show and so forth. Um, no, it, it's immediately out there. The information is instantaneous, bang. Um, and then it's open to scrutiny. And uh, so even we even use this technology when we're at uh, Gebel el Sicilla, when we're conducting our surveys there. Um, I'm on the radio every Monday, and, uh, but we're also using you know, things like Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're using emails. We're using technology to its point, even in the desert, where we can get information across the planet to certain scholars that we need information back. We need answers. We've got questions. Oh, let's speak to Professor Jim Howard in Toledo. Bang, send him an email or get him on Skype there and then and show him the live feed of what we've just found on a geological matter. And we need, a, we need an answer to this. And so it's instantaneous now. And as we progress even further now with 3D uh, imaging and so forth, um, the archaeology in the next 50 years is going to be amazing. It really is. I'm, I'm actually really envious of the younger generation where they're going to be coming out and taking over my place <laughs> in the next 50 years because um, they're, they're going to be one hell of a ride. Really, really. It's well, going to be fantastic for them. At, at, at the same time, though, it seems that the, the archaeological community also is very resistant to uh, changing anything as far as what they've already established. I mean, uh, looking at the best example, I think, is when Robert Schock had redated The, the Age of the Sphinx. Mm. No, no. I, I, actually, I have to disagree with you there, uh, slightly. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was with Robert at the Paradigm Symposium uh, this year in Minneapolis and uh, I met with Robert and we had a wonderful discussion because there's a, there's a lot of our research that uh, correlates with each other and yes the the academic community has its reservations but that's what the job is to have reservations to not to draw to a conclusion because we we just do not have all the facts Robert's research is fantastic in its own right, and it holds, it holds its own arguments within, within this research. Um, but we just do not know. We weren't there. We'll never know when it was actually built until we find something, evidence, that categorically states that it was. Sure, um, sure. Until that time, it's just pure conjecture. Um, it's pure hypotheses based upon information that we can gather at the time. Again, back to filters and perception. And so where many scholars will take Robert, uh, Robert's research and say, oh, no, piff path, no, no, can't agree with that, that's fine. But there is also a huge body of scholars that say, actually, yeah, I believe what Robert's talking about. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but I, I, I also think I also think that's yes. happened over time because if, if uh, I had him go into a little about what happened when he first came out with this information and he was not prepared for the backlash he got from the Egyptologi Egyptologists on mm. this information and on personal attacks, which is not an academic thing that should be you know that should belong in academia. Quite right, quite right. Um, yes, I mean it is unfortunate that when Robert brought out his, his material and his research, that those, those accusations took place. And it, it's, it's very demeaning, it's very embarrassing, because there are certain individuals that just will not bend. Um, but at the same time, his information's out there. Yeah. His research is out there. And, you know, Robert's still out there, and he's still doing his research, and people are still listening to him. And they're taking his research and saying, that's fantastic. Oh, that reminds me. And they go off and do their own research, which also, of course, is continues. It's continuing. And that's the whole purpose. That's learning. That's what academia, that's what is about being a human is about. It's all about. It's learning. We are forever learning. We're forever discovering. We're forever exploring. And we'll never have all the answers. Um, but as long as we continue to do so, there will be some of us who come out with theories that seem at the t at the time contradictory to what we know however over time 
that contradictory will go by the wayside and those theories will become accepted theories. Because that's all they are at the end of the day is theories. I'm not going to use sure. the word truth. Truth is a very, very harsh word to use because we don't have the truth. We only have theories uh, based upon evidence at the time. Absolutely. And, and one has to remain... I, I, I re most of the people that know me and uh, listen to me at Paradigm and so forth and listen to us on the radio and, and read my articles and so forth, they, they realize that I'm very much the person who sits on the fence. I don't go into either camp. But I represent both camps. And I, I try to be the middleman and say, well, okay, guys, here's a theory. Just take a look at it. Don't rip it apart. Just, just look at it. See what you think. And if it is completely useless, then it's useless. But if there's any, any aspect of it that has an ounce of efficacy behind it, then let's use that. Let's go with that. And let's rebuild it again. Let's start again and, and go from that point. Um, I come across information all the time, and some of it seems completely ridiculous. Sure. Um, but I, I don't just dismiss it. I never dismiss anything that comes across my path. Because you, you just never know. <laughs> no, you just don't. So I, I shelve it uh, until such a point where it arises where, oh, yeah, I remember that. I, I saw that 10 years ago. Oh, bring that back out take the dust off it and uh, have a look at it and say, well, yeah, there we go, bang, that's where it fits. Do you think that resistance to new ideas will go down with this sort of instant communication that the Internet offers? It already is. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, it already is. Um, those, we, we, we talk about this quite a lot um, within our community kind of fun thing. We talk about the walls, the boundaries and so forth. And I believe, I do believe that they are coming down slowly slowly um, but they are coming down um, you will always always have resistance to new ideas and new theories that go against the accepted mundane theories um, but though that those barriers are coming down they really are oh. as I say you know technology is is the key element here uh, fresh new minds is the key element here. Um, there will come a point where we won't even need to put a trowel in the ground um, with the advent now of this 3D printing. I can't mm. wait to see the first excavation um, based upon 3D printing <laughs> that actually hasn't excavated, if you, are, if you, underst if you yeah, understand what yeah, I'm trying to yeah. say. So, so you, you do like the radar to, to pick up what's yep. there and then use a 3D printer to print out the, the actual structure. Exactly. Non-evasive excavation. Absolutely amazing. I think that's something that we're going to be seeing a lot of. And it'll be a lot quicker, years. too. A lot quicker. And imagine the implications of that as far as teaching is concerned. Imagine taking a classroom of children out to a historic site along with a portable 3D printer that prints on demand for each child a relic that is two to three meters beneath the ground. And there that child is then holding, say, for, for, for argument's sake here, the dagger that killed such and such a king. And they're holding it in their hand. The, 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 the ramifications of that educationally are, are huge, absolutely huge. And I, those are things that really start to excite me. Because we start to look at a totally, we, look, we start to look at archaeology in a different way. Imagine if we were able to uh, 3D print uh, aspects of Gebekli Tepe mm. without having to excavate. And the ramifications, again, huge, huge. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I'd never thought about that. That's, that's an absolutely brilliant way of looking at it. You know, it's, it's hands-on archaeology. It brings it into the classroom. It, it, it allows us to educate um, the younger generation to not only respect their history, because if we don't respect their history, we don't know where we've come from. How on earth are we able to even begin to understand where we are heading? We have to, have to understand where we have come from so we know where we are going and what, well, what pitfalls are, are going to come into our view. So 
for me, it's all about education. And I think technology as it evolves now, again, not to use that word too heavily, but as it does evolve over the next 10 years or so, we're going to be starting to see an explosion within the archaeological field and the education uh, process behind that. And I think that it is. It's really, really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Especially for me, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, we've got these huge mounds of debris and rubbish at Silsila that has accumulated over thousands of years. And I'm not talking about little piles. We're talking about hills, literally hills of debris and spoil from the quarries. With something that we just cannot move. It's, it's an impossibility. It costs us far too much money and manpower and time to remove them, to see what is beneath them and within them. But with the advent of 3D printing and so forth, wow. Yeah. It, it's yeah. just wow. It really is. <laughs> that's, a, that's the perfect word for that. Yeah. Huh. Um, I did want to get to a couple more questions about the book and your theory. <laughs> and, uh yeah. Um, what are the th well? First of all, what what evidence is there for this this flood that you postulate happened? Well, the only evidence I have to offer on that is the lake itself. The lake itself is still in situ; it's still here to this very day. You can go and see it. You can walk around it, and uh, uh, as I say, you can see it from any home anywhere in the planet that's got a laptop or a PC that has Google Earth, and you can see that for yourself. And you can see the gaping hole in the in the eastern embankment. Um, so you can see that for your own self, and you can see that the body of water would have cascaded out of that, and whatever it hit, it would have destroyed. Um, and and for me, that that is the evidence. That in itself is the evidence. Um, how that took place, why it took place, um, if indeed it took place at the time in which I'm postulating, um, those are questions I can't answer. I'm afraid um, that's all based upon. Faith. <laughs> faith. Faith in my theory. Um, not a religious faith, but faith in my theory. Um, and and, and that's, that's what it's about, really. You know. And you do link the ten plagues to, to this, this flood and this destruction of, lake, of this lake. Yes, I do. Yes, most definitely. Um, we can see that with any disaster around the planet, uh, we, you know, we, we only have to look at uh, the tsunamis that we've witnessed, unfortunately, over the past few years, especially in Japan and so forth, um, where we've seen the destruction and the mayhem caused not just by the tsunami, but in the wake of the tsunami, the, the disease, the pestilence, the, the, the lack of infrastructure that's been destroyed, uh, food, water contaminated, um, disease, typhoid, diphtheria, you know, all of these different things are derivatives of any natural disaster. Now put that into context of ancient Egypt where they don't have FEMA, um, they don't have an emergency response unit on, on hand, uh, they didn't have uh, sanitary where, you know, they didn't have hospitals, they didn't have anything. This wave literally cascaded out of the lake and destroyed everything in its path. Um, all the houses that were made of mud and brick and so forth were just, just completely destroyed. And so these people had nothing left. It was all gone. Their crop was gone. Their grain stores were gone. Their, their water completely contaminated. The, the livestock decimated. So apart from just the infrastructure being destroyed, their food supply had been destroyed, their water supply had been destroyed, their shelter had been destroyed destroyed, given the heat of Egypt at the same time, but it also allowed the natural inhabitants to gorge upon the local inhabitants who no longer had the security of their houses. Um, we're talking about the crocodiles, we're talking about the hippopotami, the, the everything, the, the, the dead, the death and pestilence that would have unearthed from this would have been just, um, oh, I mean, horrendous, absolutely horrendous. One of the things I like that you guys do in this book is you actually kind of not only present the different facts to, to support your theories, but you also kind of uh, give us a story to imagine how this could have happened. Mm. I think that's the only way, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that came from our, our February um, mission, really, our expedition that we took, where Scott and I, we rambled around the deserts of Egypt, looking at the various components of both of our theories and the various sites that uh, 
pertain to our theories, which we're doing again, of course, uh, next year in February with the Exodus Reality Adventures, where we've got 10 lucky people coming with us and in February. And uh, we're going to be retracing those steps that we took and showing or presenting our theories along the way, um, but also looking at the, the deeper history of Egypt, looking at it from a different perspective other than from a, a standard touristic bus and so forth. Um, one of the, the highlights for me will be, of course, is Serabit El Khidim, the, the mountain of God in the, in the Sinai Desert. Um, there is one place that both Scotty and I agree on. Um, it, it's um, an amazing place, situated in the middle of God's country, as I call it, nowhere. Uh, in the middle of this desert, you have these, this massive mountain range. And on one, top of one of these beautiful mountains are the turquoise mines of the ancient Egyptians. But also there is the temple of Serebit el uh, which is dedicated to the deities Hathor and Ptah. Uh, in the, the actual um, shrine of Hathor, there is a natural spring which comes forth, water comes forth from there, again pertaining to the, the Moses mythology. Um, but uh, strewn across the ground as you're walking up there, which is absolutely amazing, are all of these small, large, medium-sized, broken, shattered stelae. Now, a stelae is a, is a piece of stone which is rounded at the top, flat at the bottom, and it would have been written on in a hieroglyph or hieratic or what have you uh, as, a, as a particular notice and would have been stood in, in, a, in, a, in the middle of a town or in a marketplace or as a, as a boundary marker and so forth. And, uh, you know, you, all of a sudden you had this vision of Charlton Heston standing with these two <laughs> tablets of stone, you know, uh, here I have the words of God. Um, and here we have at Serebit El Kadim all these tablets, for want of a better word, lying along the floor, uh, blanks. Hmm. Never been used, um, thousands of years old. Uh, it doesn't take a, a genius just to put one and one together and come up with two that possibly Senemut or Amenhotep, son of Hapu, was there. Right. This is where the, the migration came to. It came to this place. It was a known watering hole. Remember, the Exodus would have gone from watering hole to watering hole to watering hole to watering hole. Um, that, made much, that, that made sense. So following the trade route, that is. So it makes sense, you know, Amenhotep's there, he has his epiphany, he, he, he transcribes upon the tablets the, the basic laws, the basic morals that he's been brought up with, that he would have known as a great priest, as a great vizier, as a physician, as a magician, as an alchemist, he would have known all of these laws, and he would have written them down on these tablets and taken them down to the people and said, here we are, we may have lost everything that we held dearly in Thebes, but here I have recorded for us the law for which we will live by. And for me, that, that's, that's what he did. Um, but we're going to be retracing those steps, as I say, next year. So that, that's going to be fantastic. Yeah, I can't well, wait, actually. It's going to be really exciting. <laughs> and, and what's the website people can, can reach you? www.exodusreality.com And there's still openings on that tour? Oh, God, yes. Please, come along. <laughs> yeah, um, if, the, if, if we fill the 10 spaces, um, we'll do another one, and we'll fill another 10. Nice. Um, it, it's going to be awesome, I think is a word to use there. <laughs> um, because th th just imagine this at the moment, sir. You know, there are no tourists here. Mm. Can, you Im can you imagine walking into Karnak? I don't know if you've ever been to Karnak, but Karnak is the largest temple complex on the planet. It's, it's huge. It, 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 it's, it's so huge. It, it, it's just massive. It's, it's beyond imagination. Imagine having that to yourself because that's what you've got now. Nice. Unfor unfortunately, unfor this is the negative side. Unfortunately, because there's no tourists. Um, but on the positive side, we're going to have our, our guys with us, our lucky 10, and we're going to have every site to ourselves. <laughs> and it's going to be amazing. It's beautiful, beautiful experience. Can't wait. You're on WVBR FM. If they get the last exit for the lost, will be up in a few minutes. I just have one more thing I wanted to get to with you, and uh, I wanted to, to get your thoughts on the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> oh, that's a nice one to bring up at the very end, <laughs> isn't um, it? Isn't it the Ark of the Covenant? Um, how long do we have? <laughs> well, go for it. Let's see. Okay. Well, for me, the Ark of the Covenant 
is what we call a bark shrine. A bark shrine is, for want of a better word, the box that held the deity, the god, um, and was transported from temple to temple upon the shoulders of the priests. If you go to any of the main temples, uh, Karnak, Luxor, Medina Habu, the Ramesseum, what have you, throughout the whole of Egypt, you will see depictions of the Bark Shrine uh, engraved upon the relief of the walls. And if you just look at the Bark Shrine itself, you can easily see that it is, for want of a better word, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. It's a box with two poles that rested upon the shoulders of the priests. Um, the best dis depiction that I've ever seen really is at actually Medina Habu, where you've got the, the actual Ark itself, the Bark Shrine, with the poles sat on its uh, table, with its other tables by the side, with all the vessels and the bowls and so forth, all the, its accruitments, its lampstands and so forth, and that's all held within a tent, or as the biblical narrative, a tabernacle, and that's held within it, uh, protecting. Um, and for me, that is the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it was the, 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 the vessel for carrying God, um, be that any one of the pantheon of gods um, that existed at the time. And that's, in essence, what it is. It is merely a vessel to, to allow him to travel or her to travel from one temple to another temple. Um, when you put it into the biblical narrative, into the Moses story, I do believe that it was... Of course, everybody, everybody within the Exodus at that time were Egyptian. That's all they knew was Egyptian religion. The Judaic religion hadn't existed. It, didn't, it wasn't there. It wasn't fundamentally their religion. They were Egyptian. Um, so for me, it, it makes sense that they, they built a bark shrine to hold within it the two tablets that Amenhotep, son of Hapu, brought down from the mountain and placed them within the bark shrine, which would have been carried upon the shoulders of the priests, the so you, Levites. So you don't think it was endowed with anything special or had any kind of odd technology to it? Mm, okay, I, again, I'm going to take the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> but, you know, um, people always come up to me and ask me these questions in private, and I will have a different set of answers for them. Um, <laughs> but while we're, on the, while we're on the radio, no. No, it didn't have any special powers. Um, it was merely a vessel, a box that carried within it the, uh, the, the moral code of which to live one's life. All right. And uh, where can people find you on the web? Oh, God, you can find me everywhere. Really? I'm like a virus. I'm like a virus. <laughs> um, <laughs> just Google me. No, um, you can find me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Uh, we've got the Serious Project, which is plastered everywhere. And uh, there's no point in me giving you websites because it's, it's, in this day and age, it's useless. So just either Google Dr. John Ward, Google uh, the Serious Project, the Serious as in the star, or Google the Gebel L. Silsila epigraphic survey project oh, or yeah, just I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Siver. you know you'll find us we're there just google us you're, and, we're and everywhere want to give us a quick quick uh, brief like a real brief thing what's the serious project the serious project is um it's a multidisciplined approach uh towards our research where we bring on uh people who have um who are not academic so to speak uh laymen scholars researchers alike and we look at our research from different perspectives especially from the alternative, as he puts that in inverted commas there, um, <laughs> we, we look at it from an alternative point of view. Um, but it is also at the same time very, very scientific. We, look, we, we, we work within the confines of the academia um, because that is the best way to, to work. If you want to have your research taken seriously, you have to work within those confines at this present moment, I'm afraid. Um, so that, that's how we approach it. And, uh, yeah, so that's the serious project, basically, nice. looking at symbolism, uh, Western mysticism, and all the other components of archaeology that we, that we actually conduct here in uh, Egypt. Okay, and you and Scotty Roberts are on, uh, on, do a radio show together every week. We do indeed, Intrepid Radio. Uh, on, can I say it on here? On, sure. On, KGR, on KGRA Radio. Um, you can find us live on uh, Sunday evenings or Monday mornings if you live in Egypt. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, you can find us every, every, every week. Every week we're on there, live, 365. Okay, all right. Well, I thank you so much for talking with us. And, I speak uh, great. 
thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I would love to have you back because you also uh, deal with uh, Western mysticism and stuff, and I'd like to get into talking to you about that as well. Oh, I'd love to. All right. So we'll do that at some point in the future. Anything else people should know? Um, Just have a fantastic new year um, and never stop exploring. Never stop asking questions. And whatever you do, be safe. All right. Thank you, John. Here's some Psyche Corporation taking you out. Last exit for the Lost is up next.